You know, whenever I'm asked to speak about investment, I like to highlight that while I'm an early stage investor, I am first and foremost a heretic. And I see my role in investment as really doing some important myth busting. And I hope that you'll join me opening your minds because what I have to say won't be said by Dave McClure or John Doerr. And you will see them on stage much more than you'll see me. But what I do pride myself on being first and foremost is true to the data. And when I learn something, I don't just learn it for the sake of learning it, I implement it. So today, please join me as we talk about the truth of investment. My freshman school speech instructor taught me to always tell an audience what I'm going to tell you about, and then tell you it, and then repeat it to you. So I'm honoring that. Thank you, Mr. Keough. We're going to talk a bit about the current state of the opportunity. You know, you've been hearing it for a day and a half, so I'll probably whip through those slides really quickly so I don't put you to sleep. And I certainly can't say it any better than most of the women here and men have already said. Then we're going to move into the current state of investment. And when I'm talking about investment, we're talking about venture capital, angel investment, private equity broadly. This is investment into the next innovators, the next Googles, the next VMwares, the next LearnVest. It's important, those two names. Google those. VMware, LearnVest. Take a look at who the founders were. And then we're going to arm you with some facts. Because as you, as an investor, you as an entrepreneur, you as an industry leader, can do things if you're armed with the facts. I believe you can be the change you seek. I think our speakers have pointed that out again and again, and I'm here to just validate it one more time. So let's, you know, where women are. Once again, I just threw in the US numbers here because everyone else has been highlighting the European numbers. And I want you to know it's, it's equal opportunity globally. Women are absolutely present, and we are absolutely at the ready. Here in Ireland, I found an interesting statistic, which is Ireland is number five on the global index for women being included in the economy, well above the US and the UK. And actually, they're number five right behind Norway and Sweden, kind of those that you would expect. And so the news actually in Ireland is a bit better for women than it is even in the US, where I get, <coughs> come out of a supposed meritocracy. So if we accept that women are there, present, at the ready, in these positions of advanced education, advanced learning, and actually I should have added one, which is we sit in 75% of the patents that get commercialized. We, as women scientists, have created, participated in the innovation that in 75% of the commercialized instances made it to market. This is really important stuff. This is one myth we're going to bust right away. There is not a pipeline issue. When an investor looks at you and says, I don't see any women-led deals because there are no women at the ready, we need to invest in STEM and teenagers, you can say, yes, we do. We need to get young girls into the math and sciences. But by the way, I have my XYZ degree, and I'm at the ready, and you haven't yet invested in me, so how about me? Myth number one, bust it. So let's move into some more of the facts. Venture prides itself on knowing the facts of its investments. Most VCs will tell you that they dive into phenomenal amounts of data before they make an investment. They take a look at the market. They take a look at competitors. They take a look at all sorts of detailed IP, detailed information to make their decision. And yet, when Dow Jones, not Sharon Vosmick, Dow Jones did a 15-year analysis of venture performance, they found a startling found finding. They found that deals with women outperform their male-only counterparts. Now, they found this out in 2011. Please remember that, because we're going to talk about that again at the end. 2011, we've known this since then. We know that startups with women were less likely to fail. And actually, in the Dow Jones study, for that entire 15 years, there was not a single woman present in an absolute failure. So for venture-backed companies that absolutely failed, meaning the VCs had to write off the investment as a complete loss, there were no women present at all. Really important bit of information, I would think, as an investor, you might want to think about. 
64% of successful exits, so these are exits that actually return money to their investors, 64% had at least one female executive. And by female executive, let's do a level set that there as well. We mean in a position of equity influence. Equity meaning she's in the cap table in a way, participant. When the company exits, she's going to have an upside. She's aligned with the success of the business. In a position of influence, it means she's in a C-level position or some founding role at a level where she can help drive strategy, not just on the technology, but also on the business. And not at some arm's length from influence like human resources. While I love all of the human resource professionals I know, sadly, our industries tend to ignore them at important business times. So we're talking about an interesting place where women need to be present in order to see successful exits. Then women-led gener businesses generate higher revenue, and I know this because as an investor, the majority of my companies that are all founded by inclusive teams focus on revenue before they focus on anything else. And as you watch women-led companies grow, time and again in the Cross Dow Jones's 15-year study, those businesses with inclusive teams generated higher revenues. Really important facts. Another set of facts. Someone else has referenced this specific bit of research. And there are actually several uh, bits of research that validate the same thesis, but, but earlier someone referenced this same data, which is really important as we think about innovation. We as investors are seeking out the next innovation. And that innovation requires absolute best team performance. And what we learned is that group intelligence, where team performance leads to innovation, does not equal the intelligence of the individuals on the group. And Professor Malone at MIT, who did this research, did it at, with a fantastic level of detail, so that he algorithmically or mathematically proved that unlike individual IQ, which can be measured and can be manifest by the individual, and the higher the individual IQ, the higher performance. Group IQ is not in no way correlated to that individual IQ. And group IQ, taking the collective IQ of the individuals, actually measures, has no correlation to group performance. What does have correlation to group performance were three things that I just found really exciting to learn about. Number one was the average social perceptiveness of the group. So the better the group was at reading each other's body language, the higher the likelihood of innovation and the higher the group IQ. Number two was the evenness of conversation among the group members. Those who argued and bantered and didn't listen were far less likely to have a high group IQ than those who listened thoughtfully, sat in the room even when they weren't the ones making the case. And the third was the proportion of women on the team. What, no applause? <laughs> From this group? <laughs> I know I didn't set you up very well because I think we've heard it for the last day and a half, so I think no one is surprised to hear this. Yet it's a fact that belies the reality in my investment landscape. More to come. Let's talk about that. What is the investment landscape that I sit? For the last 15 years, you heard Kara say that I've been at Astia for 10 years, but for the last 15 years, the entire journey of Astia, the percentage of venture capital that was invested into women CEOs and founders has consistently been less than 10%. It has moved between 10 and 2%. When Astia started, it was 2%. We hit a high at the dot-com bu bubble at 10%, and today we hover right around 5%. Now, how can this exist in the face of the prior numbers and all the great talks and all the great data we've seen around women at the ready? We'll come to that. But I also want to highlight that this number is strongly connected to another number that I'm going to pull up right away, which is, interestingly, 95% of venture partners today, and when I say venture partners, I mean GPs, 
those making investment decisions, not people that carry the partner name and title, those that actually have an equity upside in the fund, the percent, that percentage, that 95% being men, interestingly has consistently for 15 years tracked and correlated to the percentage of investment going to men. So you understand that today we have 5% of VC going into women CEOs. What do you imagine the percent to be of women general partners? And that correlation, while it's not a causation, I'm an economist, so I know the difference. It is profound and enduring. For 15 years, women GPs went down to 2%, women-led companies being funded down to 2%. Took it up to 10% at the bubble. GPs, we made a great stride as women. And up went 10% the investment into women CEOs. It's a really important thing for us to talk about, especially because we're going down again right now. In between there, I had an interesting data point, which is out of Harvard. Just last year, Harvard and a number of other universities did a blind study, brought in a bunch of male and female VCs, presented the same business case one being presented by a man, one being presented by a woman, all other things being equal. An attractive white man was 68% more likely to secure funding than an attractive white woman. In between there were unattractive women and unattractive men. <laughs> Still, unattractive men raised more money than unattractive women, but unattractive women raised more money than attractive women. I have no idea what that means, but I found it curious. And I want to know who was judging if they were attractive or not. <laughs> you know, it's just wonky stuff like that. You know, we keep calling it hidden bias. I think we should talk about what it is, which that's just plain out stupid, right? We've just learned the facts, which are women are at the ready and that women are better performers for investors. And some VC is sitting there letting a hidden or genuine bias manifest an investment decision. So I'm often asked why this persists. Something that's really critical to understand is this is not an organizational issue. This is much larger. And venture, much like board seats, executive suites, is a relationship business. You don't apply for a job on the board. You don't apply for an executive seat job. And you really actually don't apply for venture. You receive venture investment when a trusted business relationship has been established. And the interesting thing about that trusted business relationship is it use a uses a lot of shortcuts to make decisions. Do I trust this person? Do I believe this person? Is this person credible? Are they a leader? By the way, all of those questions are filled with hidden bias. We answer, yes, I trust this person when that person looks, sounds, and smells just like me. Or, in the case of women, when he looks, sounds a lot like what I think a, man sh a male leader should look like. So along these business networks, what we've learned in our journey at Astia is that men and women in society, not in Intel, not in IBM, not in Astia, men and women in society are in separate business networks. And so this is a societal issue. This is a conversation for us as humans, that in order for us to change the dynamics that exist in the venture world, in the concerns around women on boards, in getting more women into the executive suite, we must do business with the opposite gender. Men must be concerned that they go to conferences without women if you intend to have women in your organization. Women, you must be concerned if you go to conferences without men because you must have men in your network. Oh, I'll take that applause, Anne. Thank you. <laughs> and specifically, I think something that has been used as a mechanism to obfuscate issues is actually women's leadership programs that take women out of networks of men, usually within a corporation, and think that that is going to solve their retention issues and their growth opportunities for women. I wish they would do organizational leadership programs, bring in men and women as peers, bring them together, make them work together, and figure out this tough stuff. Because this is tough stuff. 
There are no models of success out there. I've looked. At Astia, we've grown to 5,000 around the globe, and we have managed to keep gender inclusivity, but it's been our agenda and our focus. I'm past time, so I'm going to quickly take you through what our purpose is and our point. We value inclusive innovation. What that means is a premise. For us, if the teams aren't inclusive, we're just not interested. The data doesn't support them as being potential investment opportunity because we want to invest in the best companies. We are also not about fixing women. We don't want any more mentoring. We don't want any more support. We want access and opportunity. And best and first and foremost, we want investment. And as an investor, I intend to invest. So, Kara, I'll pass it back to you. I've set the agenda for our panel, and I'm hoping that you'll enjoy the conversation as well.